Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are following us from, and welcome to the next to last day of the Granada Seminar. My name is Francisco de los Santos, and I will chair today's session. Remember that all talks are recorded and that you can make questions at the end by simply raising your, in this case, virtual hand. Today, we have an exciting program ahead. And our first speaker is Professor Yang Sheng Wang. I hope I said it correctly. Yes. From the University of Singapore. Professor Wang research interests include Monte Carlo simulation methods, non-equilibrium rings, function and master equations, thermal and electrotransport in nanostructure and oxides, and radiative heat transfer. Today, he's going to speak about energy, momentum, and angular momentum transfers mediated by photons. Professor Wang, please. Okay. Uh, thanks, Francisco, for introducing me. Uh, I also like to thank the organizing uh, committee, particularly Pajo and Daniel, who invited me through emails, and also the other organizing committees. And uh, it's a pity that I could not go to Granada. I was there more than 20 years ago when Professor Moreau was organizing one of the CPP conference, I guess. And that's the only one I was there. So I have been never come back again. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk today is uh, about uh, transport or transfer, uh, which involve three kind of a conserved quantities. NH momentum and the angular momentum. And so they are uh, emitted by photon. So, uh, so that is the feature of, of this talk. Okay, uh, let's give an uh, outline of this talk. So uh, I roughly, uh, I break up into three parts. The first part is on radiative heat transfer or uh, the other type of transfer. Uh, so what are the experimental background? So the first one is essentially background. And the bulk part of the talk is actually this part, uh, the, which is the NEGF. Uh, NEGF stands for non-equilibrium grain function theory. And so uh, I will formulate kind of a theory uh, along the line of Mia Wengren and uh, look at this uh, transfer of three quantities simultaneously, uh, the NH, the momentum, and the angular momentum. And so we will consider this as kind of a, uh, a, a certain kind of object. They are separated in space and uh, uh, plus one, n plus one. Uh, what is that one? Uh, it turned out necessary in order to have, for example, energy conservation, we should actually consider another object which is at infinity and I will call the bus at infinity. So we derive kind of a formula, uh, we call it a mere ring grain and also Landauer formula for energy. And then we'll discuss a few issues. One of the issues is uh, uh, what is the zero point motion contribution? Uh, when does it contribute? When does it not contribute? So I will try to answer that. Uh, then uh, we will go into applications uh, for actual calculations. So here I will look at uh, the near field heat transfer between object, so in particular a graphene, uh, graphene object. And uh, then the angular momentum transfer, which give you one example of a benzene molecule, which I derived on the a current. And lastly, we look at the edge effect. Uh, so in particular, uh, the angular momentum is generated uh, at the edge when the system is not in equilibrium. Okay, that's kind of an outline of, of this uh, talk. And so let's uh, talk about the experimental background. So everybody knows the uh, black body radiation. So if you have somebody, uh, uh, some object, and uh, to a very good approximation, you can treat it as a black body, which means that your uh, energy output from, for example, a cavity, let's say you have something here, you hit it to a certain uh, temperature, and it will emit, and this emit spectrum uh, is perfectly described in most cases by this uh, uh, Planck's law, uh, for example, here is uh, typically the temperature of the sun, and uh, you can fit it quite nicely with this, uh, this form. And uh, if you integrate all those areas, the total area gives you the total heat transfer, and that is uh, uh, given by the Pontian vector uh, average. So this is the 
Stephen Bozeman's law. And in fact, Stephen uh, did the experiment that Bozeman gave you a thermodynamic, thermodynamic argument and a, a very nice result, which says that the total amount of the, uh, of the transfer is proportional to T to, to the fourth. So, uh, but this one, this black body is usually discussed when uh, the wavelengths are rather small. So the typical geometry is such that the wavelengths are small, but uh, there is kind of a near field effect. The near field effect is that suppose you have uh, two bodies and the, the two body is so close that the typical distance here is D and the D is such that D is actually uh, uh, much, much smaller than wavelengths. So in that case, this, uh, uh, your uh, uh, black body will be actually break down. In fact, it will be much larger than this uh, predicted according to Stephen Boltzmann's law. And that was uh, the so-called near field effect. So let's here, uh, I show you one slide that uh, tell you the experimental situation over the years. Uh, so about 10 years ago, uh, so Otto and, uh, and so uh, they did the experiment. So uh, if you look at the scale here, and so they can actually go down to a distance of D of the order of uh, uh, micro, one micrometer. And so these uh, uh, samples are experimental values and this dotted line are a theory. And uh, there is a one well-established theory known as uh, uh, P, uh, PVH, uh, porter von Hof theory, uh, which actually fitted quite nicely. Uh, so here is a, a later experiment, maybe four years later. And so this experiment is uh, on a much uh, smaller scale. You see that uh, this is actually nanometer. So in fact, uh, one micrometer is somewhere here. So this is the sub um, uh, micrometer uh, uh, situation. And so in this case, it also fit nicely. So basically there's no issue here. We can actually make it much smaller. The theory is still uh, good. However, uh, <laughs> a few years back and uh, maybe three years, four, five years back, and there's a new experiment and this experiment is in a much, much smaller scale. You see that now we are in one nanometer. So this is a scale and there's a 10 nanometer here. So uh, what we have here is actually two curves. This blue curve is actually the heat uh, transmission that is uh, on this scale. And uh, simultaneously, they can also measure the current because if you uh, make it too close, the current can go through and that should not be counted and so this uh, read curve co corresponding to that scale that is measuring the electric current, not the heat current. So, uh, so what happened is that uh, this uh, current here uh, cannot be fitted by any of these uh, existing theory. So there is no curve, no, no theoretical curve here at all. Uh, so uh, there is a kind of a still kind of a controversy exactly what's going on in that particular case. So, uh, so that's uh, near field effect. And uh, let's look at another effect, which are actually also related to my talk. That is the Casimir force. Uh, in fact, not only you have the heat that can transfer, but it, there is also kind of a force. So this is a, one of the famous experiment. So what you have is here, you have a plate, uh, you have kind of a sphere. Uh, I think this uh, is a metal, uh, coated metal. And uh, you can measure the force. I'm a theorist, I don't know exactly how this is actually measured, but uh, what you can see is uh, you can uh, go down to rather small uh, pico Newton scale and you can actually measure them and they actually fit it to, to the theory and this uh, solid line is the theory. And uh, angular momentum can also be measured, but uh, in this particular case, actually there are a lot of one, I pick one uh, here. So this one, uh, what you have is kind of a semiconductor here, uh, a material is kind of a junction. You can pass a current. And uh, so it's, a uh, it's sort of like a diode. You pass a current, then as a result, because, because of this uh, 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 two different kind of uh, uh, chirality in, in, this, uh, uh, in the electrons. And what you have is you, you actually have kind of a light and this light is polarized. So uh, you have a certain amount of a spin up, spin down, and uh, the, the angular momentum of the light is actually different. And uh, this is, uh, uh, can be useful for, for example, for information transmission. So, uh, so given that background, now I go to the real, real topic of uh, my talk that is uh, uh, this uh, theory of uh, uh, non-equilibrium uh, green function. And it turned out that this is a very, very nice theory because uh, we want to study transport. 
So if we study transport, we have to be something that is not in equilibrium because in equilibrium, nothing can be transported. So uh, this is actually a very uh, uh, elegant theory to study such a situation. So, uh, uh, so let me uh, give you a quick brief of the introduction of this uh, uh, historical perspective of this one. Uh, so it started with the Swinger and Swinger, uh, uh, Swinger was interested in the Brownian motion, uh, basically the quantum, uh, quantum Brownian motion. So in quantum Brownian motion, uh, uh, he introduced uh, kind of a six different brain functions and that turned out to be a, a rather useful mathematical object. Uh, so uh, that will be the starting point uh, uh, in, in the sick case. And uh, simultaneously, almost at uh, uh, the same time, uh, Kadnoff and Baim has a famous book, which you, uh, some of you may know. Uh, this is the quantum statical mechanics. And so in it, they, they also discuss this uh, non-equilibrium green function, but in a form of a slightly different language. So here uh, they talk about the greater or less green function. And uh, the motivation there is actually try to derive the Boltzmann equation from the non-equilibrium green function from a more rigorous mathematical perspective to, uh, to derive the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so, uh, Kind of beam essentially used so called equation motion method, but the uh, Caldis developed a, a diagrammic e expansion. Uh, so, this is a very similar to a Feynman diagram expansion, except that the Feynman diagram usually is at t equals zero. And the uh, Caldis generalized uh, generalize this to the contour, uh, which I will give you an introduction uh, soon. And so, uh, then people use it to do transport. So, uh, actually, Carnoli is one of the first one to study electron transport and uh, Mia Wengren uh, try to generalize this uh, to more general uh, a system that has interaction. And we did in the last few years, uh, past, uh, past few uh, many years uh, on uh, thermal transport, quantum thermal transport. So we focus on uh, energy transport uh, in, in phonon systems, uh, sometimes also in electron systems. Okay, so uh, what is this uh, energy? Uh, so here is a very important concept that is, uh, uh, we have to evolve the system on a uh, contour and this contour is called Caldi's contour. So what happened is that if we have kind of a, a certain quantum operator, uh, I will call it O, and this operator, if, uh, so this is in the Schrodinger picture, and if you transform them into the, uh, the Heisenberg picture, and you have to multiply a, a, a evolution on the left, on the right, but that corresponding to a kind of an evolution, either you evolve the forward or evolve backward. So, uh, so it's actually convenient to define the evolution itself on this contour, so that uh, given uh, two particular point, uh, that is either uh, on the upper one or on the lower one. And so, uh, so in general, we will call it the tau. And this tau is actually uh, considered of uh, uh, the actual time, which is the time. Uh, so actual, actual time is here, but also you have the plus minus, uh, which is the so-called forward uh, branch and the back, back of a branch. And so this we will denote as a sigma. And so uh, we have to have kind of an object or evolution that is evolved over here. And so in general, we will let it evolve from minus infinity to plus infinity and back to minus infinity. In fact, you don't have to really go to minus infinity you only go to a kind of a certain time that is relevant to your problem and then you go back to the minus infinity. Actually, there is something here uh, because when we study uh, kind of uh, equilibrium or non equilibrium, we have to start from certain distribution. So what we have is that uh, you have to have a, a density metric that is at minus infinity. Usually we take the product uh, 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 equilibrium state as the, our initial state. And so we can actually uh, also write down a Heisenberg equation and that is generated on this contour time rather than the Euler time. So with that, we, have, uh, we can define a green function. So the green function, uh, uh, because we are interested in the photon, so what is relevant is this photon uh, field. Uh, so uh, specifically, it's the A vector, this uh, vector potential uh, that is, goes into here. And we use uh, something called a phi equal zero gauge. So uh, we don't have the scalar potential, only the vector potential. And this vector potential, of course, is a vector. So it has an index new, but it's also a space and time. Uh, however, this time will be the contour time. So that will be some, some time over here. And uh, we take two of them to look uh, for the correlation. 
and uh, uh, by convention, we divide by the one over i h bar, and this will be our central object of our theory. Uh, we, uh, we call it green function or the photon green function. And uh, this uh, green function is defined on contour, but this remember that the contour actually means uh, the actual time uh, that's t, uh, a possible branch, which is either plus or mon minus. So as a result, uh, if you look at all the possible combination of this contour, uh, the, the you can have uh, four of them. You can have uh, a plus plus. So it means that if you, both of them are on the upper contour, uh, this is equivalent to the time order because we want to order them so that the one on the right should be early in the contour and the one on the left is late in the contour. So this is actually the same as time order and uh, the minus minus is anti-time order and uh, this uh, cross term we call it g greater g less. And so uh, with this four, uh, sometimes we also like to have this retarded one because the retarded one is related to a linear response. It's a more useful quantity. So the retarded one, it turned out to be related uh, is equal to uh, dt minus d less. And uh, although you have four, but actually uh, there's kind of a relation. So uh, only three of them are really independent. And so these two uh, plus that two is actually equal to as uh, uh, equal, and we call that k. And uh, another relation is uh, we, we have this called advanced. So A is advanced uh, and uh, R is called retarded. And there is a relation with this less and greater. So, uh, so this is the, the basic object, but uh, uh, you can think of this as the most fundamental. This is like your equation of motion uh, in integral form. And uh, uh, this is also defined uh, on contour. And uh, this is actually the Dyson equation on contour. And this Dyson equation on contour can be uh, uh, go back to real time. And if you go back to real time, it turned out to be two pair of equations. One is the retarded Dyson, another is called Galdish equation. And this is uh, one of the most important ones is called Galdish, uh, Galdish equation. And so what is this uh, V? And uh, this V is actually uh, the free, the so-called free field. And that can be written as kind of a differential operator because you can turn this into a kind of a differential equation rather than a integral equation. So uh, if the system is in equilibrium, we have the so-called fluctuation dissipation theorem. That means the G less is actually related to the GR minus GA and N is this uh, uh, growth function. Uh, okay, let's explain a little bit more about this uh, V inverse operator because this is a, a quite important uh, so uh, as I said earlier, we do this uh, so-called phi equals zero gauge, uh, so that the only object that we really, really that is matter is this vector field, and the uh, Maxwell e equation uh, imply that uh, a uh, satisfy this equation. This is essentially from the from uh, from b uh, together with the other equation. Uh, so uh, so uh, with some algebra, you can show that the a satisfy kind of. Uh, Almost like a wave equation, if you, uh, uh, but not quite, because when you expand this, what happens is you have you you got a dot a, uh, then you have another uh, term that is uh, uh, Laplace. N. So uh, it's actually a kind of wave equation if this is a transverse. But because of this, it's not exactly the same as wave equation. Uh, here, uh, c is the speed of light, and. Uh, you can formally solve it. So uh, that is the meaning of uh, V. V is essentially map the current into the A and uh, the electric field is just uh, the de uh, derivative of E. And you can quantize it and uh, it's slightly tricky, but uh, um, uh, we, we can do it simple minded. And if you do the canonical quantization, uh, you can use this commutation relation. And uh, that is essentially uh, all we really need. Uh, oh, uh, what is uh, the setup of the our problem? Our setup uh, problem is the following. Uh, let's imagine I have uh, an object. So here I label them one, two, three, and uh, so n is the last one. However, uh, it's convenient that I have one more. Uh, this one more, I call it bus at infinity. In other words, uh, this outer circle is actually one of the bus. Uh, so this is uh, called n plus one or infinity. And uh, uh, we take a uh, kind of a circle, uh, in fact, sphere, and let R go to infinity, and we see what uh, going to happen. And uh, this one is important because uh, in order to consider energy conservation, for example, uh, those objects emit and they actually go to infinity. And so in order to account for the total amount of energy and uh, uh, that has to be summed to zero, 
and so that uh, some uh, uh, energy lost, but it's actually gained over here. So we we can have kind of a conservation of energy uh, uh, with kind of an equation like this, uh, running one from n plus one, and that is equal to zero, and that is the implication of the energy conservation. So what is the question? The question is, uh, what is the energy emitted? Uh, how much this energy goes out, or maybe it goes in? So in, uh, we are talking about the net energy. And uh, what is the force that is applied to this object? Is it a force or, or not? The Casimir force is just a special case of this. And is there a, a torque that is OK, uh, try to rotate them? Uh, so is there a torque or not? So that's our problem. So how to answer this question? Uh, we, are, we are going to base on the uh, Maxwell's uh, equation. So the idea is that uh, for each of the object, let's focus on uh, the object alpha. I will make kind of a, a kind of a surface here. And this surface includes this object. And uh, we do kind of a surface integral. Uh, with a norm that is going outward. So this is the norm of the surface. And so, uh, so this question of how much energy is emitted and what is the force, what is the torque can be answered according to electricity magnetism. And that is nothing but the pointing vector. The energy is the pointing vector. The force is Maxwell stress tensor and the torque is R cross the Maxwell stress tensor that is given by this formula here. Uh, so, uh, but it turned out that the surface integral is not really convenient. And we use the divergence theorem to convert them into volume integral. And the, the nice feature of this volume integral is that if you look at this very carefully, you found that the formulas are always of, of, of some A, some G, some combination of A, some combination of G. Uh, so uh, taking uh, uh, into the fact that you could uh, take a time derivative, space derivative, or both. Uh, so uh, uh, that is uh, essentially our uh, uh, starting point. And so in the end, we do, uh, we do not do the surface integral. We do the volume integral. We integral over, over the volume. And uh, this volume has a current here. And if they don't have a current, then this will, uh, will not contribute. So that means that I can choose the surface arbitrarily uh, enclosed it, and I should get the same answer. OK. Uh, and now, uh, because the theory involved this a dot g uh, 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 everywhere, so I will define a new function, new green function, and this new green function is given by uh, uh, this a and the g combination. And so I focus on particular uh, object called alpha, and so the current that that is running here and uh, that will contribute to this uh, if alpha, and it has a, a very similar kind of a structure like the d that I have just defined. OK, uh, so uh, how to proceed then? Uh, if we sum over all the, uh, uh, all the alphas, then we actually get a total current. So in, in other words, uh, if, we use, if you sum over the alpha over here, and that means you sum over the alpha over here, and uh, then basically you have to look, at, look for the correlation of a dot, a dot g as kind of a contour ordered kind of a green function. And uh, I will, uh, don't have time to really go through the uh, uh, derivation. And uh, you can prove that this quantity, uh, if you sum over alpha, uh, is actually uh, uh, very nicely related to another quantity that I have already defined. That is this uh, D, which is the green function for A. So D is AA correlation. And what is the pi? Uh, actually, I didn't say much about that. Uh, the pi is, is uh, so-called self-energy. Pi is actually the, uh, in the form in the Dyson equation. So D satisfy D equal V plus V pi D. And so that is this one. So, uh, so this is actually kind of exact equation. Uh, you can use equation of motion to prove that the case, but you could also use a Feynman diagram. So this is actually a, a, a quite kind of straightforward uh, 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 relation between F and pi. Uh, so, uh, Actually, this sample is kind of a deceiving. Uh, what what I have here is actually quite complicated because remember that the pi uh, d is actually a function of r and the tau, r prime, uh, double prime, and tau double prime. And similarly for pi, so what you need to do is to, you need to convolute them. So you need to integrate over all the r's, uh, integrate over all the tau double primes, and the sum over news. You know, you know what? This multiplication actually is the multiplication of these three variables that you have to uh, do the convolution in that variable. And uh, after you have done that, of course, you get a function that has 
uh, these uh, remaining variables. Uh, the next step is to assume so-called additivity. Uh, in, in other words, uh, because I have uh, this three object that is uh, uh, n object that is separated, I can actually uh, say that my pi is equal to the sum of each one of them. So if each one of them are well separated and uh, they don't really talk too much uh, to each other, and then I can actually say that this, uh, uh, this pi is just a uh, sum of each one of them. And if that's the case, I can plug, uh, uh, plug this into here, and then I get uh, this re re result. And, uh, but unfortunately, this result is only approximately correct. Uh, but it should be a very good approximation. Uh, I think I will explain it in a minute. And uh, so once you get into this form, uh, this is still in counter time, and you want to go into uh, frequency time because for actual computation, it's much more uh, useful to be in there. And what you do is that you actually make this in the real time, then you do the Fourier transform. And so if you do that, you, uh, you found that you can rewrite, uh, rewrite this in terms of something called the Langlois rule. So uh, that is essentially that uh, the K component uh, can be written as the R and the K and K and the A. And so uh, basically you become two terms uh, when you are uh, writing in terms of the retarded uh, and this K, uh, the K is called Kaldish. So Kaldish component. Okay, uh, let's take a look at it more carefully. Uh, what is the, uh, what is this pi? Uh, pi is, uh, uh, we call it self NH, uh, but actually depending on what sort of Hamiltonian I'm actually using. So uh, what, what I'm using is that I assume that I have kind of a original unputted one. So this original unput one, including the photon and the electron. So, uh, so I take electron as my kind of a, the most important system. Then there's the interaction. So this interaction will be the interaction of the electron with the uh, field. And so if we take this uh, characteristic form, so this is essentially A dot G, and this is the known as a minimum coupling uh, interaction. There is actually a, a square term, but this extra term actually don't really do much. So I will omit that. And uh, if you make a Feynman diagram expansion and look at the Lewis order, and the Lewis order turn out to be this diagram. So this is the, the electron line. And so uh, this is uh, this triangle denote this uh, aim. And here uh, you have this outer line that is the, uh, connect to the photon line uh, because this actually has three indices. And so this diagram is known as RPA. Uh, for practical calculation, this is uh, uh, very good enough because uh, so this uh, diagram is proportional to alpha square, uh, uh, proportional to alpha, and uh, uh, which is e square. And alpha, we know that uh, for elect uh, electrodynamics, is is a very small number. And if you go to higher order, for example, this particular diagram known as uh, Aslamzov uh, Larkin diagram, this diagram do not have additivity. So no additivity. Why? Because this diagram. Yeah, so if you put uh, say a certain uh, alpha and it will actually connect to beta. So uh, you cannot write as uh, sum of the two, but this one you can because this, uh, uh, this diagram, uh, this electron line has to be continuous. So that means that th this diagram is either alpha or another one that is a beta. So the total diagram is just adding uh, those. And if you are familiar with some other part of the, this electricity mechanism, it turned out that this pi it's just related to the dielectric uh, uh, function here through this formula or the conduct, uh, the optical conductivity through the other formula. Okay, uh, so the, now we have to look at uh, the observable. So what sort of quantity we need to uh, calculate? Uh, so th there is some uh, kind of an issue that, that is uh, going into this. That is, if you have a quantity that is Hermitian, but the product is usually not Hermitian. So, uh, so how do we choose that? There are two choices. One is you symmetrize them. One is you use normal order. Uh, initially, we made a mistake. We tried to use normal order, but the normal order uh, run into problem. So actually, that's not the correct one. Uh, so this, uh, the correct choice is this. And this choice can be related to the k-green function, which is uh, 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 this particular form. 
Okay, so uh, with that, we are more or less done. So we can actually give this uh, mayer wengren formula. Uh, if you still remember that we can re rewrite this volume integral. So if you put the volume integral in and uh, pick in some derivative, it turned out that these three quantities, this NH, this force, the torque, they can all express by the same formula uh, with the same function F that I have just defined. And uh, so this is actually a quite kind of an interesting formula because uh, it's essentially unify uh, all the, of them. And uh, what you see is that if the energy transport, you have to have the frequency goes in here. And uh, if it's the force, it's the momentum operator that is here. And if, it's, uh, if the angular moment, it's actually the total angular momentum. It actually has two parts. One is the uh, orbital one, one is the spin one. And so uh, remember that this F actually has two argument. So this has R and R prime. And th this operator acting on the first argument of this F uh, uh, function. Okay, uh, actually I, I write it over here. So, so, the, so th this operator acting on this uh, R, not R prime. Okay, uh, so uh, let's talk a few words about this bus at infinity. Uh, uh, some, uh, some years, a uh, long, uh, long time ago, and uh, Ecker had actually introduced this concept of a uh, uh, bus uh, at infinity. Uh, he don't use that word, but he call it uh, kind of a dust model. Uh, so basically, you put a kind of a lot. Uh, uh, you put a material that it goes to uh, with a dielectric count go to one. So it's sort of a like a like dust, and they absorb NH. And uh, this concept is elaborated again by Krieger, and uh, uh, so the. From the dissip fluctuation dissipation analysis, you can show that it turned out that this, this pi is nothing but the R that I have introduced earlier. Remember, the R is actually the, the, uh, the Dyson equation V, uh, the, uh, okay, uh, this is the inverse of that. So it's this quantity. And uh, however, this quantity is a kind of an operator. So you have to operate on something. Uh, but uh, uh, in that case, it's uh, not really convenient to, to do calculation because you have to solve it and you're not to actually op operating on it. So in other words, uh, the, you have to actually take this and operate it on D, but the D have to be, uh, uh, you have to solve this Dyson equation in order to get the D. And so uh, what we found is that we can actually make it more concrete by making this uh, define it on the surface. In, in other words, uh, this pi is defined in the volume that is outside the circle, but uh, uh, this particular formula is actually defined precisely on the circle. In other words, it's only depending on this direction. And uh, what you uh, uh, do is you actually need to integrate over the solid angle in order to get uh, what you have. Okay, uh, uh, I want you to uh, comment on this uh, uh, self NH. So if you take this self NH, and then you can ask the following question. The question is that, uh, let's say that our system is such that I just have a circle, nothing else. And remember that this circle means you have a bus at infinity and I can actually pu put a temperature here. So uh, I, I put the temperature uh, T and then ask the following question. The question is, what is the energy density at the origin? And the answer turned out to be the precisely the black body result. And that is uh, what we should expect because we are supposed to have kind of a sort of a cavity. So this self energy actually help you to do that. Okay, uh, let's see, I still have uh, maybe 10 minutes, right? So uh, there is one special case that is uh, uh, so-called the local equilibrium. That means that uh, at a particular object alpha, I will assume that this alpha has a temperature and it has a local equilibrium. Because it's in local equilibrium, I can use the fluctuation dissipation theorem more precisely. Uh, uh, basically, it says that the pi can be related to the pi r. And uh, so uh, with this fluctuation dissipation, uh, with some uh, kind of a simplification, you can actually symmetrize the expression. You, you got another expression. And this equation is, uh, we call it Landauer, uh, Landauer form, because uh, this Landauer form actually is sort of uh, explicit on this uh, uh, distribution is R, uh, n alpha minus n beta. So this means that the zero point motion will never appear because they will actually cancel when you try to derive it. Uh, actually, initially it has, but in the end, they get canceled exactly. 
Okay, uh, so now the, uh, when should we have a zero point motion, when should not? So to answer that question, actually we can do it, uh, uh, I can give you a formula. So if you take that form, uh, original formula, which is the mere wing grid, and you try to take the limit t equal to zero, n equal to, uh, then, uh, then n equal to zero if omega is actually positive because I integrate over the positive frequency, it turned out to be, uh, we have kind of an equation. The question is, is this equal to zero or not? Uh, uh, Actually, the answer turns out depends because it uh, for the energy transmission is always zero, but for force, sometimes is zero, sometimes is not zero. In fact, the Casimir force is one case that this is not equal to zero. So even at t equal to zero, you still have a kind of force that is a Casimir force. Okay, uh, now last slide on theory. Uh, okay, I think my time is all right. Uh, so the previous theory that is based on uh, the vector potential A, but actually the vector potential uh, is the full theory. Uh, we could actually uh, consider kind of a limit and that limit we call it non-retardation limit. So what is that? That is the limit when C go to infinity. So if, the, if you take the speed light C equal to infinity, and if you take the Maxwell equation, what you found is that it, you actually have just the Poisson equation. So in other words, this is the Coulomb. So in fact, uh, uh, the A and the phi are related by kind of a gauge transformation. Uh, so in fact, if you take this non-retardation uh, retardation limit, what you have is only the longitudinal part of the A and that if you make a gauge transformation, you become the scalar potential. And here, uh, basically, it's parallel to the other one. And uh, in fact, this is actually more, more important because Coulomb is more important than this. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, Coulomb is more important when the distance is small so, uh, uh, than the uh, transverse one. So here, uh, for example, we study a graphene seed and we are interested in the distance which are rather small. So in that case, uh, this is actually more convenient to use because uh, here uh, the green function is actually uh, no indices anymore. It's just one ago number rather than uh, a matrices. Okay, uh, let me go through a few more slides. That is uh, uh, the actual calculation. So uh, here I have two plots here, uh, actually uh, in two uh, papers. And this is a more recent one. This is kind of a, uh, older paper. So what we are doing here is that we take uh, two graphing seeds, uh, just as uh, what this plot was showing over here. Uh, one is on solid K1, one is 300 K1. And uh, we ask, uh, what is the heat that is transferred among those two? Uh, we actually take a ratio of this value that is the black body result with the actual calculated one. And what you see that here is that it's actually pretty large. It's uh, four order magnitude larger than the black body irradiation, so 10 to the fourth. Uh, so uh, this curve is calculated based on a tight bounding model uh, with uh, just near renewable humping uh, uh, with the standard model and uh, uh, with uh, some chemical uh, bi uh, potential bias, uh, not exactly at the direct point. Uh, but this particular one is a more recent calculation and this calculation is with first principle. So this is uh, uh, based on quantum expression and the Berkeley GW calculation. So this don't really have any parameter. It's just the fit first principle parameter, uh, no adjustable parameter. And you see that uh, they actually quite match very, very nicely. So this limiting value is uh, quite close. Uh, in fact, this is already uh, very small. This is a one astron. Uh, so uh, we will expect that uh, we may, uh, when we go to one atom, uh, the theory actually breaks down because uh, the electron turn to tunnel and what you actually have is that they will actually show up rather rapidly when you go to below one atom. Uh, so we don't really trust the, this particular value, but those that is uh, maybe if, uh, say one nanometer, that should be uh, trustworthy and uh, uh, they are more or less the same except there's a little feature here, which we don't have in this uh, tight binding model. Uh, here is a kind of a different kind of a calculation. So here, uh, what you have is kind of a nanotube, a two nanotube, or maybe a triangle, and uh, uh, you take the so-called zigzag, and zigzag actually has kind of a localized surface state. This, this, this surface state is a kind of a state at uh, kind of a chemical potential equal to zero, and that surface state actually play quite important role here. And uh, what we found is that uh, if you put this in the media, 
uh, with a dialect constant. In other words, you actually have, have some other stuff there that is uh, represented by epsilon. So uh, if epsilon equal one, uh, it turned out to be quite small. Uh, the epsilon one, I guess, yeah, it's cannot see. So, uh, so if you put a dialect constant that's uh, really high, it, the, the transmission will be uh, quite enlarged and it will have a peak here that you can actually detect. Uh, then, uh, okay, so this one, uh, yeah, three minutes more. So what we uh, studied here in this particular example is that we have a benzene molecule. So this benzene molecule basically is kind of a run, they, they hop here, the electron hop from site to site. Uh, uh, they actually put into a battery, uh, connect them to, to, to a lead. So electron can, uh, the current can go through them. And because that uh, uh, these are not quite symmetrical because here you have two atoms. Uh, if you go that way, you have uh, four atoms. And so the, uh, these current are actually going right, going left are not equivalent. So as a result, you actually emit uh, angular momentum. Uh, however, if you connect one and a four and make it symmetrical, it turns out you don't have angular momentum. And uh, so those are the formula that we can do this. Uh, so let me show you one more uh, uh, plot. So what happened is that uh, most of the time uh, you actually have rather small or zero angular momentum. And suddenly when you actually adjust this uh, chemical potential and if it is past one, so, uh, okay, in units of this T, so one actually corresponding to this energy level here. So if your energy level pass over here, then suddenly you get a big value and that big value actually corresponding to kind of a, a jump from this level to that level. And that uh, has kind of a, a emission of the angular momentum. So this happens uh, only when you are here. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, this is a sort of a kind of a profile that if you zoom in here, you, you have this sort of a low range. And uh, what, what the plot here is actually the total, uh, total power, but, uh, the integration of this give you the total value that is plotted on this plot. Okay, the, uh, the la uh, last slide. So last slide is something like this. So if you put a, a piece of uh, graphene uh, in this particular case, uh, let's uh, put a piece of uh, uh, so-called zigzag graphene and so this graphene is supposed to be semi-infinite. In, in other words, uh, in X direction, uh, we have a kind of a, a current passing through, uh, but in this direction it's supposed to run to infinity. So in, in other words, uh, this is actually just one, uh, one edge, the effect of one edge. So the effect of one edge is that uh, if you are in equilibrium, uh, that uh, the equilibrium actually is designated by this uh, diagonal line. So this diagonal line means that uh, the chemical potential are the same. So in other words, there's no bias going this way or that way. So in uh, here you actually get zero, but if you have kind of a finite bias, so if these two are different, if you are go away from it, for example, you go like this, then uh, suddenly you will actually have kind of a contribution. And so the angular momentum will be emitted due to non-equilibrium situation. Uh, so that is still, working in progress. We are still working on that uh, problem. Okay, let, uh, let's see, my time is just right. So uh, lastly, I like to thank my group members. Uh, the, you made this uh, uh, graphene angular momentum uh, emission. And Zuto had this calculation on this uh, uh, first principle calculation for the uh, any transfer. And uh, also, uh, Zhu Qian did the, the calculation on this angular momentum uh, you mentioned for the benzene molecules. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Wang, for a quite interesting talk. Now we have some time for questions. I see that uh, Maria Pedrosa wants to ask. Maria, you can unmute yourself and make your question. Maybe it was a misclick.
María. Okay, I have a question myself. Okay. What is classical and what is quantum in your what approach? What is the classical, what is quantum? Uh, well, the, the quantum part, of course, is in this distribution n. You see that the formula here, they have, they have this n flicking around everywhere. Uh, that is uh, uh, this n, this is both distribution. Uh, if it is a classical, of course, you just get uh, uh, you just get this uh, one over beta. Uh, that that is the equal partition. But uh, so essentially, this n appears in several places, like uh, there, and also uh, when you are looking for the uh, distribution. Uh, oh, let, let's look at this one. For example, uh, this pi signifies the material property. That has its n, so that is a quantum part. Mm -hmm. But the electron itself, when you calculate this diagram, clearly they have to be kind of a quantum system. Uh, electron itself is quantum. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's wait for some more questions. So it seems that there are no more questions and I'd like to thank Professor Wang again. Now we have some spare time until four o'clock here in Spain. So we will reconnect in approximately 10 minutes. <laughs>